it hold. That was a planned hold. What is not planned, however, is the weather, which is lousy. It is raining down there at the Kennedy Space Center, raining so hard that although the crew, and there you see a satellite picture of how the cloud cover looks around Cape Canaveral, and indeed over the entire United States, but the weather is so lousy that although the crew is aboard, there is some question at this moment whether the mission will have to be scrubbed this evening. Standing by at the Kennedy Space Center, my two colleagues, Lynn Scher and Gene Cernan. How does it look at the moment and what's happening? Well, Ted, this is not what was planned at all, as you said. In fact, earlier today, they predicted the weather would be bad during the afternoon and would be perfect at launch time. What's happened is there are two different storm systems that have moved in. The weather forecasters were sure that at least one of them would be totally gone. It does seem to have happened, but another one may be moving in, and the cloud cover may just be too much. At the moment, that hold that they entered into that you mentioned, it's meant to be a 10-minute hold. There is a chance they will hold it even longer to see if Challenger can wait a little bit until the cloud cover goes so it could go up on time. Gene, how does it feel to you at this point? Lynn, we've had a spectacular night already with that lightning array. Uh, I hope it will be more spectacular with the launch of Challenger. Uh, we have some pictures of, uh, of that lightning. Here we can see the uh, Challenger on the pad. And those bright flashes, they almost look like flash bulbs, but indeed they are. As we saw, it streaks of lightning. The last time I saw that was on Apollo 12, and that was not a very good omen. That, of course, was after Apollo 12 had lifted off. Challenger is safely on the pad, and as far as we know, has certainly not been touched it, by the lightning yet. It, it's my feeling right now, Lynn, uh, with the uh, synopsis of the weather we've just seen, that they're holding as a precautionary, or they might hold as a precautionary uh, measure, but that uh, we will see a launch tonight. I, I think the weather's going to hold off long enough. The lightning is gone. The thunderstorms are gone. We're simply concerned about the, the height of the clouds above the ground and the visibility, how far the pilots can see, in case they have to come back here. Okay, let's board. take a look at what the astronauts are doing earlier this evening. You can see uh, there's the crew of the 8th mission having breakfast. Dale Gardner, that's uh, the commander, Richard Truly. That's Guy Bluford, America's first black to go into space. And there's Dale Gardner, another mission specialist. Dr. William Thornton, at 54, the oldest man to go into space. He has waited and 17 years yes. for this flight, so he ought to be happy. <laughs> Daniel Brandenstein, we passed by. He is the pilot of this mission. Now here they are. They are about to leave that building. Obviously, they are joking. They're laughing. This was about an hour and a half ago. Um, they are leaving this building to go over to the orbiter itself. And you're going to see when they walked out how terrible the weather was at that point. It was pouring, the rain just coming right down on their van and on them. It is not, by the way, raining very hard at the moment, just some drops around, but it is that cloud cover. Now here they were getting into the van. We're having uh, Shuttle Launch Control give us an update on this hold. At 2.15 this morning, uh, the latest word that we have from Bob Crippen flying the shuttle training aircraft in the vicinity of the pad, however, is that the conditions have improved. Uh, there is no precipitation in the immediate vicinity, and the uh, layer of clouds that they had the most concern for at the 9,000-foot level also has no precipitation in it. However, uh, they do expect that they probably will stay in this hold at the T-minus nine-minute mark in order for uh, all of the mission managers here to get a final go as far as weather is concerned. Uh, well, as you've told, they are going to hold for longer than their planned 10 minutes, and as you probably remember, the window for the launch is something a little bit over a half an hour, so that they could keep on holding for probably for a half an hour if they wanted to. Well, those were the crew activities a little bit earlier tonight. Now, assuming they do get off on time with their spectacular night launch, of course, they will be doing lots more, and our colleague Jules Bergman is in Houston, and he's now going to tell us some more about this crew. The most familiar face on board is the commander, Dick Truly. At 45, he's a veteran of the second shuttle flight, back in the days when there were only two men on board. The thing that gets easier, frankly, is that uh, two people was too few for the shuttle. The pilot, Navy Commander Dan Brandenstein, served as Capcom on both the first and second shuttle missions. This time, he'll help Commander Truly fly the shuttle. Brandenstein is 40 years old. Also 40, Lieutenant Colonel Guy Bluford, an Air Force fighter pilot with a Ph.D. in aerospace engineering. His job as mission specialist to conduct scientific experiments and deploy the Indian communications satellite, INSAT. Another mission specialist, 34-year-old Dale Gardner. A Navy lieutenant commander, Gardner holds a degree in engineering physics. He'll operate the shuttle's remote arm. 
The doctor on board Challenger is Bill Thornton. At 54, he's the oldest astronaut ever to go in space. A pilot, doctor, and electronics engineer, Thornton holds more than 35 patents, including the exercise treadmill that is now standard aboard all shuttles. His job, to study space adaptation syndrome, better known as space sickness. The crew of STS-8, perhaps as diverse a group of men as has ever been lifted off a launch pad. Well, that was the crew of eight. Now you can see the clock is holding at T minus nine minutes. It has not resumed yet. Uh, if it doesn't resume within another few seconds, we will assume that they are going to delay at least slightly from that planned 2.15 a.m. launch. And while we sit here and wait to see exactly what's going to happen, we have been joined by an astronaut who recently flew on yet another mission. She, of course, the first American woman to go into space, Sally Ride. Sally, thanks for coming along. You're the person that was in that place <laughs> at T-minus nine minutes only two months ago. Give us a sense of what's going on right now. Well, actually, the T-minus the nine point was, was kind of a turnover for me. At T-minus uh, at nine, what you really want to do is, is concentrate on what's about to happen to you. And I found that before T minus nine, I was doing a lot of little things that really didn't matter, like adjusting pencils and writing on mini board, uh, anything to keep myself busy. Keep yourself busy. And at T minus nine, when the clock started counting, all of a sudden we were all part of the shuttle. You can feel it and you can hear it, and you really know that, that you don't have a lot of control over what's about to happen. Let's listen in now to the voice of uh, shuttle control, launch control. Supervisor of range operations, which basically assures us that the Eastern Test Range and all of its uh, contingency sites are ready to support a launch this morning. Again, everything here, uh, the vehicle is in good shape, uh, waiting only now on a final uh, weather clearance for launch. Uh, the uh, STA uh, with uh, pilot Bob Crippen aboard is uh, flying around the shuttle landing strip, making approaches to both ends of the runway uh, to give us some indication of how clear the pilot's uh, line of sight would be in the event of a return to launch site aboard. We'll continue to monitor the status and await further word from pilot Bob Crippen on the status of this morning's launch. We're at T-minus nine hours and holding. This is shuttle launch control. Sally Ride, now that everything is wonderful except for the weather, they've got this 34-minute window, give or take. Uh, can they hold at this point for, for half an hour, do you expect? And I think that at the T-minus at the nine-minute point, they can hold for the full duration of the, of the window, uh, about 34 minutes. You were sitting in the shuttle in the same seat that Guy Bluford is occupying, if I'm not mistaken, and acting as flight engineer going up. What's so special about that uh, on, on a mission like this? <laughs> well, that's a, that's, a special, that's a special seat. It's, uh, you know, you're really part of the launch team. You're part of the ascent team. Uh, you, have, you have control over the checklist, and you've got, uh, you've got a lot of duties to do. Okay, well, we will be uh, waiting and watching with you if you have any... Um, inside information to give us, needless to say, we'd be happy. Oh, but let me just ask you, Bob Crippen, of course, flying the, uh, the weather plane, he was your commander. Um, what is he looking for specifically? It's cloud cover, I assume, for the most part. Yeah, it's primarily the cloud cover and the visibility. And uh, he's the one that makes the call on the weather. If the weather looks good to him from a pilot's, pilot's point of view coming uh, towards the runway, then, then he'll give the go for launch. It's as simple as can he see the runway lights and can he get back here? That's right. Okay. Sally Ride, thank you. I hope we have a a good launch to watch together. So do I. This is, of course, a night launch. Um, if it does go off on time, and if it does go off tonight, and even if it doesn't, it's still a night launch. And it is not the first night launch in NASA's history. You saw at the beginning of this broadcast um, a night launch that occurred a little over 10 years ago. And there's a fellow that was suiting up for that night launch. That was Apollo 17, an astronaut by the name of Gene Cernan. I Gene Cernan? You, you <laughs> slipped one in on me, Liz. <laughs> that is a long time ago, but it, it just brings back memories being here uh, tonight watching the, the uh, spotlights on that shuttle. Uh, we're in for a spectacular sight. There's no question in my mind that it's going, and, and I think we all will be awestruck, especially me. I've never seen a night launch. You know, I am told that, the, the, obviously, the shuttle's windows are much bigger than were your windows on Apollo, so they are going to be able to see more than you would have seen. Well, they're much bigger and are much closer to the flame pattern. Uh, we were way on the top of the stack, and we had uh, several of our windows all but one, as a matter of fact, were, were covered up for, to protect us against the... Uh, uh, the winds and the and the vibrations of launch. And NASA has told us that on this launch, this is based on your launch, at this launch, uh, as a result of the flames from the solids and the main engine, that people up to 450 miles away will be able to see the, 
the the launch after it gets up to about uh, oh, about 20 so miles up. I, I think that's true. I think you'll see people from Miami to South Carolina, uh, Georgia, Alabama see this launch. The one thing that no one really thought about is what the crew is going to see because you know they launch in darkness. And for Dick Truly, he's seen a sunrise. Sally has seen a sunrise uh, around the Earth, but uh, the other four crew members never have. And uh, one of the things, the first thing that they're going to see when they get into space is the sunrise in front of it will be a spectacular sight for them. They said they didn't feel cheated, that they weren't going to get the spectacular view of Florida that everybody else has gotten when they went up. Um, I suspect they'll see something a lot better. Okay, we will be back with more coverage of the launch of the Space Shuttle Challenger after a word from our local stations.